we are going live on today. Amen, somebody? Well, we're in the month of February, and um, this is the month that we celebrate um, Black History Month. Also, Valentine's Day is in the month of February. And um, so we're going to be talking all this month about relationships. All this month, the whole month of February, we're going to talk about relationships. And I'm calling this a Godly Home Series. I'm doing my own Godly Home Series. What kind of home? I didn't hear y'all. What kind of home? How many of you know God wants a Godly Home? He wants godly relationships. Amen. Not worldly relationships, but godly relationships. And we're going to be talking about godly relationships all month. A godly home. What does it mean to have a godly home? What are, what are our responsibilities to one another in these relationships? particularly the marriage relationship. Amen, somebody. How many married folk we got in the house? Amen. How many single folk that want to be married? Amen, somebody. All right. So I want to preface this message in this series that this is not going to be a panacea or cure-all for your relationship. However, it is a blueprint for those who desire to go up in godly living. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. So also we have to read what we're going to read and what we're going to share. It has to be a balance in your hearing. Okay. I'm not trying to start a doctrine or be very or dogmatic because everybody's situation is different. However, the word of God does not change. Your situation may change, but the word of God does not change. Amen. Somebody. All right, so we're going to start off this morning. Again, our title is Godly Home or Godly Relationships. And today, um, our subtopic is going to be how to deal with tension in the home. How to deal with tension in the home. And I'm going to start off in the book of Titus uh, in the New Testament. How many know that? that there is a book called Titus. We don't reference Titus too much, um, but we're going to reference Titus today. Amen. Now, they are uh, two books in the Bible uh, that we refer to as pastoral books or pastoral epistles. Um, Paul writes this letter to two of his sons in the gospel concerning the church concerning the church. Somebody say good doctrine. Good doctrine. good doctrine. good doctrine. So in Titus chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, I'm going to read this in the New English translation. I need you all to pay attention. All right? Because I think this is serious and uh, we're going to treat it as such and we're going to be blessed by the word. So Titus chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, are you there yet? It should be on the screen for those of you who don't have your Bible, but it says, but as for you, but as for you, communicate the behavior that goes with sound teaching. One translation says sound doctrine. Somebody say sound doctrine. Sound doctrine. Uh, older men are to be temperate, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and endurance. Verse 3 says, Older women likewise are to exhibit behavior fitting for those who are holy, not slandering, not slaves to drinking. Is that what it said? Excessive, Excessive drinking. But teaching what is what? Teaching what is good. There should not be one woman in the house who is a sloppy drunk. Amen, Amen somebody. Amen. If we stand with the word, right? It says, but teaching what is good. Verse 4 says, in this way, they will train the younger women 
to love their husbands, to love their children, to be self-controlled, pure, fulfilling their duties at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands so that the message of God may not be discredited. So that the message of God or the gospel, the word of God, shall not be discredited. Now, uh, Sarah, can you put verse 4 in the King James Version? The King James Version. Verse 4 in the King James Version. Notice what it says in verse 4. We'll wait till she get it up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So y'all already know this is going to be tight. <laughs> Amen. Verse four. Notice it says that they may teach. Somebody say teach. teach. That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. Now, if I'm not mistaken, I believe, my brothers and sisters, this is the only verse in the Bible that specifically tells a woman what to teach. Let me say that again. If I'm not mistaken, I believe this is the only scripture in the Bible that tells a woman specifically. Notice what I said, because some people can't comprehend. I said specifically what to teach. What does it say? Now, this is King James. They, that they may teach. Who is they? It's talking about the women, the old women. To teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, and to love their children. Then say, teach them to prophesy. Then teach them to say, to, to lay on the hands. Then teach, then say, teach them to preach. Then say, teach them to be a prayer warrior. To teach the young women how to be sober and to love their husbands. I'm going somewhere with this. Because God wants a godly home. Godly relationships. We go around with our conferences. We go around with our prayer conferences and everything else. And there's nothing wrong with that. But Paul Remember, he starts off with saying, this is sound doctrine. Y'all, he said, this is sound doctrine. This is sound teaching right here. Everybody, other people may be preaching this. Everybody be, may be preaching that. He said, but this right here is sound doctrine. This is sound teaching. We just read it. Go to Genesis chapter three. There's much more I can say on that, but I'm not. God wants a what kind of home? A godly home. That means more to God than your prophesying. That means more to God than your laying on of hands and your preaching and whatever. He just told you. The older wives will teach, train, admonish the younger women, how to be wives to who? Their husband. How to love their children. How to love their husband. I didn't make it up, y'all. It's in the word. He said, this is sound teaching. This is sound doctrine. This is what we have to continue to walk in. Because if we don't walk in this, there's going to be consequences. Genesis chapter 3, let's look at verse 11 through 13, and this is in the New King James Version. See, this, I'm going to tell you what the, the uh, talk show hosts are not going to tell you. I'm going to tell you what the view is not going to tell you. And Dr. Phil, 
and Judge Judy and all these podcast hosts, I'm going to tell you what they're not going to tell you. I'm going to tell you what the magazines are not going to tell you. Because they want you to make, they want to make relationships seem so attractive. But the Bible's going to tell us the truth. You should hear it from your pastor. Amen, somebody. Amen. Genesis chapter 3, verses 11 through 13, it says, And he said, this is God speaking, Who told you that you were naked? Of course, we're going back to the beginning, the garden. He says, have you, he's talking to Adam and Eve, right? He says, have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me. She gave me of the tree and I ate. Verse 13 says, and the Lord God said to the woman, what is it that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Here, God is coming on the scene. Adam and Eve had done something that they were not supposed to do. And who does God address first? The man. He said, what have you done? And you know what the man did? He said, this woman. Now, here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen, I know how you see it, but it wasn't like how you see it. See, Adam and God had a relationship. So what is really going on is God is asking Adam a question as if you're the blame. Now, watch this. But Adam is redirecting something back to God. You have to take responsibility, too. Oh, y'all, y'all miss that. You, you, you have to take responsibility to God. Now, you notice the next conversation is with the woman. After Adam did a redress. <laughs> then God deals with the woman. Oh, y'all miss that. Verse 13, the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, of course, the serpent deceived me. And I ate. Now we know in the New Testament we have some type of clarity because the scripture says that Eve was deceived, but Adam sinned. Oh, y'all, y'all. Eve was deceived, but Adam missed the mark. What you, what you say? Somebody say tension. tension. Go to Genesis chapter 3, that same chapter. Look at verse 16. Through 17, but this time I'm going to read it in the New English translation because I want to bring clarity. Genesis chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. Are you there? Say amen. amen. The Bible said, To the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your labor pain. With pain, you will give birth to children. Watch this. You will want to control your husband but he will dominate you. Somebody say tension. Verse 17 says, but to Adam, he said, because you obeyed your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Curse is the ground thanks to you. And painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. Somebody say tension. tension. See, that's what they're not going to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, for every single person that wants to get married. There's going to be tension. And the reason why there's going to be tension is because sin entered into the world. But see, you're not going to hear that from the podcast host. You're not going to hear that from the people who are on The View and all these other things on television, you're not going to hear there's going to be tension in the marriage. And my brothers and sisters, it's supposed to be. 
It's supposed to be. Did God know it? Yes, he knew it. Was that his plan? No, it wasn't. God not, did not intend for there to be tension in the marriage, but because of one act of disobedience, there's tension between the man and the woman. Adam said, you the one gave me this woman. God said, you obeyed the woman. Somebody say tension. tension. Let me give you the definition of tension. Tension is mental or emotional strain. That's the tension I'm talking about. There are many definitions, but the definition that goes along with this teaching, I'm talking about mental or emotional strain. So when you get married, all you single ladies and men expect there to be tension, mental strain, emotional strain. You know what we're talking about? We're talking about the soul. Yeah. Amen, somebody. When you get counseling, did, did the preacher tell you that? Did the person who was marrying you, did they tell you that? Did your mother tell you that? Did your father tell you that? Did they tell you it's going to be tension. You know, before we, my wife and I got married, our last session with the pastor in our premarital counselor session, before we walked out the door, you know what he told us? He said, listen, marriage is all about dying. He said, don't get married if you're not willing to die. No, he wasn't talking about a physical death. He was talking about dying to yourself. The apostle Paul said, I reckon myself to be dead. He said, I die what? Daily. Daily. Don't get married if you're not willing to die. Charm is deceptive. Beauty is fleeting. But a woman that fears the Lord is to be praised. You're not willing to die. Forget how cute they look now. How handsome they look now. There's going to be tension in your marriage. Oh, it's not going to be like you want it to be all the time, especially if one of you all are not willing to die. Somebody got to die. Let me give you a, a sentence of tension. I like this. I found this on the Internet. A mind that is affected by stress or tension cannot think as clearly. A mind that is affected by stress or tension cannot think as clearly. So because of sin, the fall of man a marriage will have tension. Now, it might. Somebody say, it will. It will have tension. All the married folk can testify. <laughs> Amen, somebody. <laughs> you will have tension. Amen, somebody. And it's good. See, why you're courting and you're dating, this is why I tell people who come into my premarital session, session, I say, listen, date as much as you can, court as much as you can, because when you get married, yeah, yeah. amen, somebody. Tension. <laughs> what did it say? Mental and emotional strain. Amen. Somebody said, help me, Pastor. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Date, I'm telling you, dating is fun. And I don't know why people want to skip steps. You want to go straight to the marriage. Are you missing the fun part? Dating was fun. Courting was fun. Going to the movies with Aunt Alita was fun. Amen, somebody. It was fun. 
You know, staying on the phone. That's ooh, I love you. You love me. How about, how about? Let's cuddle. <laughs> that was fun. That was the fun part. And you don't even know it. And this is why you should never wish your life away. Amen. Say, so, well, Pastor, how do I wish my life away? By always trying to live in the future. And not living in the present. Some of you right now wishing your life away, thinking about the next step, the next this, the next this, the future, the future, future. You living in the future and you can't even take advantage of what's going on in your life in the present. And you so rushed to have it, you know. And, and I hate to keep saying this, but he was such a good pastor. My pastor would say this, the path to the prize is sometimes greater than the prize itself. <laughs> the path to the prize. But you know, when you get it, you're like, man, I thought this would be more gratifying. I thought I'd be more satisfied than this. And you didn't even understand it was the path that you were on. The relationships that you built, the experiences that you went through. That was the best thing. Amen, somebody. I was so in love when Ashley and I was courting and, 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 and all that other stuff, man. She could get me to do things that I wouldn't dare do now. Amen. She was sending me to the grocery store, Brother JT. I'd be in the grocery store, lost and confused. <laughs> Ma'am, can you help me? I'm looking for this. It's on aisle eight. They looking at me like, you should know. I'm like, I don't know. Um, get me to go to um, Krispy Kreme. I don't think it was Krispy Kreme on Wilkerson. Before you come over, can you stop the Krispy Kreme? I said, yeah, baby, I can stop the Krispy Kreme. <laughs> At the church, amen, somebody. At the church, I'm stopping uh, Krispy Kreme and Wilkerson, getting those donuts, bringing to her. Boy, now she asked me to get some donuts. I'm like, listen. <laughs> those are the best times. But we're supposed to have godliness. Let me give you the definition of godliness. Because remember, we said godly relationships, right? What kind of relationship? Hallelujah. New relationships are fun. They are exciting. Amen, somebody. Godliness is a lifestyle, watch this, that is consistent with the character of God. It means moral uprightness. That's the definition of godliness. Let me say it again. It's a lifestyle that is consistent with the character of God. It means moral uprightness. And moral uprightness, my brothers and sisters, is not you just being polite. Some people believe that if you're just polite to your husband or if you are just polite to your wife or your boyfriend or your girlfriend, that's godliness. No, that's not the definition of godliness. Should you be polite? Yes, you should. But that's not godliness. Godliness is following the path or trajectory that God has laid out for your life or for everything in your life. So when you're following the path and purposes of God for your life and in your life, that's godliness. Now, who lays out the plan? Who lays out the purposes? God does. We're getting to a point right now in the, in the culture, nobody wants to define roles anymore. But God defines roles of a man and a woman. He defines purposes for everything, and he expects you to follow. You can't say you are godly when you go contrary to the purposes of God. God said, I've laid you, I laid the man to go out this path, but God ain't the path I want to go. And you go another path, well, then you can't say you're godly. 
I want the woman to go out this path. This is what I have designed for the woman to go, and this is what I have designed for her to do. Well, I don't want to do that, God. Well, you can't call yourself godly. Because that's not godliness. Go to Genesis chapter 2. See, we're going back to the foundation. Because if the foundation be destroyed, The Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 23, verses 25. The New English translation says, are y'all there? So then the man said, then the man said, this one at last is bone of my bones and flesh of what? My flesh. This one will be called womb man. Now who called a womb man? Adam did. God didn't call a woman. God called everybody man. Adam said, this, this right here, because she is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, I'm calling her woman. For she was taken out of man. Verse 24 said, that is why a man, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and unites with his wife. And they become a new family. See, that's why I want to read it in the New English translation. They become a what? A new family. Verse 25 says, the man and his wife were both naked, but they were not ashamed. And that's why I said, man, it seemed like everything was bliss in the garden between the man and the woman. Then all of a sudden, sin came and then there was tension. Tension. See, I've laid out the protocol. I've laid out the blueprint. A man is supposed to leave his mother and father and cling to his wife. That's godliness. You, do, I'm doing a premarital counseling session right now. I, I just told a couple, I said, you, I, to, I was talking to the guy, I said, you don't sit there and leave your wife because your mama called you to go do something. My mama called, I got to go. My mom, my, my, my mom, listen, if you, if you, you, well, then you ain't the one for me because I ain't my mama, my mama. You ain't married to your mama. And why is you, you not married to your daddy? I'm talking about godliness. See, I told you, you want to see, see, Satan wants you to veer off the beaten path. See, we want to veer off the beaten path and call it godliness. Amen, somebody. But we're going to stay with the word. You don't do that. You married your mama? No. You married your daddy? No. Your daddy can't give you children? Shouldn't be. <laughs> Come on, somebody. What did the Bible say? You, you, you become a new family. That's the way God wanted it. And just in case you, you kind of like, I don't know, Pastor, go to Matthew chapter 19. Let's see what Jesus said. Your Savior, who died for you. Your Lord. What did he say? So, you know, Pastor, that's just Old Testament. That's just an old way of thinking. Yep. That old way of thinking is going to save you. Amen, somebody. Look up, the husband gone early in the morning because morning, mama called. Amen, somebody. Come home tired. Mama done wore him out. We done fixed everything in mama's house and everything in your house is broken. Wife like, when are you going to fix it? When I get time. But your mama just called. You flew out the house. So y'all don't think that goes on, right? It just, Pastor, you just making that up. It goes on. 
I'm trying to help you. Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 through 6. Notice in the New English translation, the Bible said, Then some Pharisees came to him in order to test him. You know, they're coming to Jesus to test Jesus. They ask, Is it lawful to divorce a wife for any cause? He answers, Have you not read that from the beginning the Creator made them male and People say Jesus never talked about marriage in the New Testament. You a lie. He did. He said he made them what? Male and female. And said for, for, see that word for? Explanatory word. That means the Holy Spirit getting ready to explain something to you. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and he will be united with his wife and the two will become one flesh. Verse six says, so they are no longer two, but one what? Man, it's being redundant. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. King James Version said, no man put asunder. You hear that from the preacher back in the day? Let, well, God at the, at the, um, the, at the uh, wedding, preacher stand up, what God has joined together. Let no man put asunder. I didn't even know what the word asunder was. S separate. Amen, somebody. So what helps tension in the home? I'm not going to be long because I'm going to say something for next Sunday. What helps tension in the home? Somebody say Godliness. What helps tension? Like, Pastor, help me. I, how, how can I keep tension from being in the house? Well, one word, godliness. Godliness will keep tension out of your house. Come on, somebody. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 2 through 5. See, when you do it God's way, it's going to help you. People want to listen to everybody except for God. And you want God to bless your mess. But God said, you won't do it my way. Tension came by sin. You're not going to get around it. We're going to have to deal with it. And the Bible tells us how to deal with it. Godliness. I don't know how any person could get married without having God at the forefront of their home. Amen, Amen somebody? Amen. You know, I told y'all last week about the story how, you know, Anselita and I, uh, you know, we almost got an annulment. So if we got an annulment, so you know it had to be early, early on in the marriage because you can't get an annulment after six months, I think. Amen, somebody? And I said, because she didn't have no socks on. <laughs> y'all yeah, yeah, remember that? Because she didn't have no socks on and and, you know, I just was so upset because she ain't had no socks on. And, um, and then you know, I gave her $250 to get some groceries. And she just had snacks in the, um, in the thing. She said, you didn't tell the whole story. I did have some ground beef and, and <laughs> what did I say? Yeah, ground beef and, and, mac, and pack of chicken. I didn't see that, but she said it was in there. So, Brother Leslie, it was nothing but snacks, snack cakes and tater chips and Doritos and all that other stuff. So, I'm like, what in the world? So, you know, I'm thinking I got some change back. <laughs> there was no change back. And I, said, what? Ain't no change. I said, well, how much change you got? She said, ain't no change. What's about change? <laughs> ain't no change. <laughs> JT said, ain't no ever. <laughs> I was, I was, JT said, ain't no ever no change. <laughs> I was like, I got, no, I got some change. Man. Ain't no change. You better change. Ain't no change. Amen, somebody. So, but, but my point is, we had the Jesus part packed down. We, I mean, Jesus wasn't the problem. She loved Jesus. I loved Jesus. We love, both loved Jesus. It was the other stuff. See, that's what they don't tell you. Amen, somebody. Because we both come from different homes and backgrounds. 
She learned what she learned from her mom. I learned from what I learned from my mother and my father. And we all trying to come together to make it work. And there's tension. Come on, somebody. When we, when we, you know, we started clicking. This is why communication is so important. Somebody say communicate. So, you know, when we Anselita finally got it to where we was like, OK, let me sit down and we talk about what, what you want. And, you know, because, you know, in my family, where I grew up in Dublin County, we sip Kool-Aid. Anybody, no, somebody, we was a Kool-Aid family. Amen. I make Kool-Aid for my family. Dun, 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 dun. I make picture at the picture. Y'all don't remember that? <laughs> anyway, I was a cool. My wife and them didn't drink Kool-Aid. Amen, somebody. Wasn't no Kool-Aid. She said, you want Kool-Aid? I said, yeah, I need some Kool-Aid in the house. So she would go to the grocery store and get Kool-Aid. But because there's tension in the family, she didn't even bring the right Kool-Aid home. Amen, somebody. You know you got to have at least grape and strawberry. <laughs> Where are all my country people at? <laughs> Kool-Aid. What a what a what a what a strawberry. <laughs> hey Amen. Somebody, Chris, you know what I'm talking about. Like, look, look. See, y'all, you city folk, y'all don't. And, and and then I said, baby, I said, you know what else I want? She said, what you want? I said, I want this picture. Ain't gonna do it. I need a clear picture because I want to open up the refrigerator and see the Kool-Aid <laughs> in the picture. Somebody say grace. <laughs> Grace. Tell my, tell my, yeah, I think I'll be married to pastor. No, you can't. <laughs> Somebody say grace. You have a grace for whoever you supposed to be married with. So, tension. But my wife got me that clear Kool-Aid picture, though. And she got the big one, too. Eh? And just, just stirred it up. And we got the Kool-Aid. Amen, somebody. And then she just winged me off the Kool-Aid. <laughs> Glory be to God. We don't drink Kool-Aid in the house no more. Somebody say tension. Tension. But we see we had the Jesus part pet. We didn't have that was that was what saved us. Because some people will break up because of the little stuff. How many of you been in an argument and then later on you don't even know what you were arguing about? Don't even what were we arguing about? I don't even know. Tension. First Timothy chapter six, verses two through five, New English translation said, but those who have believing masters must not show them less respect because they are brothers. Instead, they are to serve all the more because those who benefit from their service are believers and dearly loved. Teach them and exhort them about these things. Verse three says, if someone spreads false teachings and does not agree with sound words, that is those of our Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ and with the teaching that accords with godliness. Y'all see that? The teaching that accords with what? Godliness. Verse four, he is conceited and understands nothing but has an unhealthy interest in controversies and verbal disputes. This gives way to envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions. See, when you don't start off right, my brothers and sisters, all you're doing is opening a door for somebody to be suspicious. You got to start off how you want to finish. I'm talking about in your relationship. Because the whole time, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't do it right, the man is going to be thinking about how, what he did to get you and what you did to loose yourself from your morals to entertain him. And then you're mad because he always checking up on you. Y'all. Y'all missed that. He trying to deal with his mind while you're gone. Because the devil is messing with his thoughts. Well, how did you get her? She might be out there doing the same thing. 
See, that's when you don't start off right. Sometimes it ain't the marriage, it's how you court it, how you date it. The Bible says evil suspicions, verse five, and constant bickering by people corrupted in their what? Minds and deprived of the truth who suppose that godliness is a way of making a what? Profit. So my brothers and sisters, if you really want to profit in your relationship, you have to follow. You have to learn what? Godliness. So I told you my classes wouldn't be long. My classes, out these conferences, and mine wouldn't be long. I can just tell you what I need to tell you in an hour. You know what your problem is? You don't stick to godliness. You got your way, he got his way. And those ways are not God's ways. You on this path, they on this path. And you're competing against one another. You know, one of the three areas of conflict, there's three main areas of conflict. You know, one of the, one of the areas of conflict, the reason why people have conflict, especially in homes, is because of differing values. That is true. Values. Your values are not my values. You know where we learn values? Growing up. Come on, somebody. And then you want to be unequally yoked with somebody <laughs> who don't have your values. And you say, this, it'll work. It'll work. Listen, we're going to be the exception. We don't need to go to pastor for premarital counseling session. I don't need no man telling me what to do. We're going to work because we in love. Because we in love, we're going to be the difference makers. We the power couple. <laughs> Fight the power. <laughs> Amen, somebody. Amen. I told you, opposites attract, but they don't what? Amen. They don't last. Amen, somebody. You got to get your rough neck and learn the hard way. Amen, somebody. <laughs> and then... Again, you want somebody else's emergency to be your urgency. Yes, go ahead. Or they want their emergency to be your urgency. But your emergency ain't going to be my urgency. Especially when you don't do it the right way. So all that has let me know is no matter what situation you're in, you're going to you're going to have issues because you don't know how to follow instructions. You don't know how to be godly. Go to 1 Peter. This is my last scripture. We're going to close. Anybody want to profit in their relationship? Anybody want to get ahead? Amen, somebody. God wants what? Godly homes. What kind of homes? Godly homes. Godly home, godly relationship. I want relationships to stay together. Do you know over 56% of Christian marriages end up in divorce? That is true. Do you know over 70% over of marriages today, the couple has lived together before they got married? And you know, y'all sit up here and y'all laugh at me and Anselita because we sitting there talking about the socks and the Kool-Aid. But you know what? My wife and I didn't live together before we got married. The Lord. And we didn't have sex. The Lord. So the whole year, the first year, we getting a chance to know each other how to live and cohabitate with each other. Oh, y'all, y'all. <laughs> yeah. That's why we needed Jesus. What? What you say? Y'all can look at her, I ain't lying. <laughs> She'll let you know if I was lying. We ain't live together. Amen, somebody. We did. I went over to her apartment every now and then, and you know, but that doesn't do it justice when you live together. Yeah, what? Amen, somebody. I remember telling my aunt, I said, I don't know if this is gonna work. 
and because Ansalita, boy, she just neat, just just clean. Like I go over her apartment, ain't even no footprints in the carpet. <laughs> I mean, it ain't even no footprints. I'm you know I'm walking like this. <laughs> There ain't no water in the sink. You know, the leech, you, you come to my apartment, there's water in the sink. You know, it might be a couple of dishes, but, but her thing, man, it was just like, oh my goodness, man. And then when we got married, she got me all organized. You know, I threw away my wire and, you know, I, I threw away my wire hangers before um, we got married and I elevated to the plastic hangers. I thought I was doing something. I had green and burgundy. Come on, somebody. Anybody? I thought I went to Walmart. Plastic hangers. When I got married, my wife got rid of all my plastic hangers. I was like, what you doing? She said, no, you're going to have wood hangers. What you say? And then when she finally hung my stuff up, I said, okay. Then she color coordinated my stuff. Hey, man, I had my my, my, my red shirts and, and all the other stuff. And, and then like my winter stuff, she would put them away. Uh, when the summertime came, and then when the summertime came, it, well, I, said, I said, wow, this how this gonna work. I said, I can, I can deal with this. Amen, somebody. I said, you know, compliment. She complimented me, I complimented her. Amen, somebody. Amen. You got to make it work. You got to find a way. Amen? Amen. Somebody say godliness. godliness. What I say? First Peter 3, 1 through 7. The Bible says in the same way, in the same way, wives be subject to your what? Your own husband. Didn't say somebody else's husband. So your own husbands. You get your own. Amen, somebody. And leave that other person's husband alone. Amen? Amen. So then even if some are disobedient to the word, they will be won over without a word by the way you what? Live. Live. That's how you win your husbands over. That's how you win your wives over. By the way you live. I ain't talking about you just being polite. And it goes on to say in verse two, when they see your pure and reverent conduct. See, some of you, you're not allowing God to change your spouse because you dirty and nasty. Your temper, your mouth, you always got something to say. You always going to get the last word. You're not going to let God move through you by you keeping your mouth shut. But I'm telling you what the word says. Verse 3 says, let your beauty not be external. The braiding of hair and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. But the inner person of the heart. The lasting beauty of a gentle and tra tranquil spirit, which is precious in God's sight. That's what God likes. Dolce and Gabbana, Louis Vuitton, that don't move God. Gucci, that don't move God. You know what moved God? Your temperament, your conduct, your behavior, your attitude towards the things of God. And treating one another right, that's precious to God. Verse 5 says, for in the same way the holy women who hope in God long ago adorned themselves by being subject, what, to their husbands? Then give you an example, like Sarah who obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. King James Version says, Master. You know why she can call him Lord? You know why she can call him master? Because Abraham gave his wife something to submit to. Abraham proved that he could hear from God. When Sarah got up every morning and she turned around, she didn't have to do things that other women do because she had a servant. 
but y'all ain't. She walked out of the tent, ladies and gentlemen. She looked around. Abraham had servants. He had cattle. He had, he had uh, donkeys. He had um, silver. He had gold. And she knew that he didn't get it by himself. But she knew where he was before, when she, before she married him. She knew his situation. And she said, man, God has multiplied my, my husband. God has blessed my husband. Who couldn't help but to submit to somebody like that? Watch this. Who can hear from God? That's what you need to be attracted to. Somebody who can hear from God. Who can move with the cloud. Who got their ear towards the ground. God said we got to do it this way. And put your foot down. Said, we're not going. We can't go over there. We can't be where everybody is and laugh at everybody's jokes. You got to have a man in your life who hears from God. This is where we're going. This is where God told me to go. I done took Anselie to a lot of places. I moved her. I'm talking about moved her a lot of places because I said, I, this is what God said. Inconvenience her a lot. But she went with me. Y'all ain't saying nothing. See, the world will tell you to be attracted to the wrong thing. Be attracted to his E-class. Be attracted to his Tesla truck. That's what it tell you to be attracted to. But no, what you should be attracted to, ladies, is someone who can hear from God. Abraham said, uh, uh, Sarah said, I don't mind submitting to my husband. Why? Because he hear God. This, this is what the Bible says. It says you become her children when you do what is good and have no fear in do, doing so. Talking about we children of Abraham. What about the children of Sarah? What did Sarah do? She submitted to her husband. But that ain't cute no more, Pastor. I got to be independent. I-N-D-E-P-E-N-D-E-N-D. -E 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 you know where that? Got my own house. I got my own car. And you by yourself. I'm all right by myself. You're lying. COVID prove you lie. Because now you're sitting in there talking about, I need a man. Because it's not good for man to be alone. But yeah, you know better than God. And you're going to convince yourself you okay. Amen, somebody. Amen. You're gonna, I'm going to convince myself I'm okay. No, but the Bible says it is not good for man to be alone. Amen, somebody. Amen. When I'm talking about lonely, I ain't talking about being alone. It's talking about lonely. How many know there's a difference? Because your pastor can be alone. But lonely is a different thing. And I'm talking about the spirit of loneliness. Amen, somebody. What did Lee Williams in the spiritual QC say? Sometimes I like to be in company, but then I like to be all alone where I can talk to my heavenly father up in heaven on the throne. Some people, they don't even want to be alone at all. Got to always be in front of company. Somebody got to always be in your face. God said, well, what about me? When are you going to get along with me? I'm about done. Verse 7 says, husbands in the same way. It says, treat your wives with consideration as the what? Weaker partners and show them honor as fellow heirs of the grace of life. And this way, watch this, nothing will hinder your prayers. Somebody say, do it God's way. Nothing. I don't want anything hindering my prayers. I find myself apologizing a lot, and it don't bother me. That's Lita, I'm sorry. I might not even be the guilty culprit. Amen, somebody. But I don't want nothing to hinder my prayers. Am I by myself? I'm like, man, you know, I know I'm right. 
But I'm like, you know what? It ain't even worth it. I want peace in my house. Anybody want peace? Baby, I apologize. What you apologizing for? <laughs> what you apologizing for? And you had to think about that thing. Like, what am I apologizing for? Oh, she said, no. She said, you okay? You all right? I said, I know, but I just, I just feel like I need to apologize. Because I don't want my prayers to be hindered. Amen, somebody. I want prosperity co to continue to flow in my house. Amen, somebody. So it means a lot to me what she thinks. It means a lot what she thinks. Stand to your feet. I don't just disregard her feelings and what she thinks. Amen, somebody. I'm always like, baby, what you think about this? What you think about that? You like this? You like that? What you think about this house? I don't want that house. And I think, oh my gosh. <laughs> but if you like it, then it, it'd be okay. I'm like, no, 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 no. You like this car? Uh, I don't like it. But that's what I had my heart, you know, I had my heart set on that, Charmaine. And then she's like, no, I don't like that. Like, oh my God. Back up. <laughs> It's not worth it. Amen, somebody. We got to learn to be what? Godly. Follow God's design. Amen, somebody. That's the way you're going to get rid of tension. Some of you got tension right now. It might not be with your wife and not, might not be with your mm -hmm. husband, but it's a relationship you got tension with somebody. And nobody's acting godly. As a matter of fact, the world tells you to act the worst you can so that people won't make, people won't think that they can just run over you. That's what they tell you. But the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. No, 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 no. I got your back. You don't have to act like that. Stay godly. Amen, somebody. Are we going to stay godly today? You're going to stay godly in your relationship. It's not cute. I don't like to see women just using profanity all the time. I'm old fashioned. Amen, somebody. I don't care how fine you are. You start cussing. Mouth just ugly. Amen, somebody. You might be a five plus five who drive millennials in the world, but to me, you are two. <laughs> Amen, somebody. You might be good looking on the outside, but on the inside, you ugly. ugly. Yes. Amen, somebody. And you know what the Bible say, God don't like ugly. No, the Bible don't say that, but it <laughs> should be in there. <laughs> it's not in there, but should be there. You know, you know, you ever read the Bible and say, you know what, it ain't in there, but it should be in there. Should be in here. No. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much. Hallelujah. We thank you today for godly relationships. The Bible says, with godliness plus contentment is great gain. It's great gain. Godliness plus contentment, with contentment. It is great gain. So we thank you today that we are profiting, not just profiting financially, Lord, but we are profiting because we follow the trajectory of the Holy Spirit concerning our lives, concerning our relationship, concerning us being fathers and husbands and those who are women, who are wives and mothers. We thank you today that you love you, us so much that, Lord, that it is your desire that we don't be alone. That we don't be lonely. But there's a grace we grow into. Because whenever that person comes along that we're supposed to spend the rest of our life with, Lord, we shall be ready. We shall be ready to mirror the church. 
the, the relationship with Jesus and the church so that we can be a light to the world. And it's not just about us, but the marriage institution is holy. The marriage institution has a purpose because God instituted it to the world to be a reflection of Jesus and the church. And we thank you today, Lord, and we pray that as we offer up these supplications to you, that any person that may be challenged and struggling in their marriage because of tension or someone refusing not to follow the way of godliness, or someone who may even be caught up in the, in the act of adultery. Father, we pray that you will have mercy, that you will comfort them as they stand alone, that you will comfort them, Lord, as they sit and they wait, that you will comfort them, Lord, as they stand by and they lean and trust on you and continue to do the right thing even though the other person refused to submit. We thank you, Lord, that they will lack nothing. They will not lack anything financially. They will not lack anything mentally, socially, or physically. But Lord, Father, that they put their hope and trust in you, the Lord of glory. May you come in and rest and abide in them. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen and amen.